understand cause and effect to say if we do something this way we can measure what it does to human being and why that happens that then helps us and inform us into how to make decisions about doing it better the next time to prove or disprove what you know already by anecdotal uh, reports and then you have the ammunition to say architecture matters to health Perhaps nowhere can there be found a stronger link between the power of intuition and the knowledge that's generated by research than in the life and career of Dr. Jonas Salk. Dr. Salk in the early 1950s was working in a laboratory similar to this except it was in Pittsburgh and it had no natural light, it was below ground. His quest was for a cure for polio, a dreaded disease of that time, and he'd been working feverishly to come up with that cure. He became frustrated because he was experiencing one disappointment after another in his intense efforts. So he decided to take a retreat for himself. Fortunately, he selected the 13th century village of Assisi. That village is characterized by wonderful buildings in earth tone colors that have monasteries and cloisters and abbeys, all overlooking a beautiful, broad plain at the bottom of the hills below. And what Dr. Salk told me was that the spirituality of the architecture there was of such great inspiration that he was able to do intuitive thinking far beyond any he had ever done before. Under that influence, he said, I intuitively designed the research that I thought would result in the cure for polio, returned to my laboratory in Pittsburgh to validate the design, and found that it was indeed correct. During the decade that followed Dr. Salk's discovery of the cure for polio, it was a great outpouring of support from all of America, including the March of Dimes Fund, that enabled the development of a large institution that could continue the kind of research that had been done resulting in a polio cure. Dr. Saul came to West Coast in California to select a site for the building of that institution. He came to this site. Obviously, the character of the, of the gorge that you see coming up from the ocean to this higher level must have reminded him of what he had seen at the Hermitage in Assisi. The next step was to engage a very prominent architect, Louis Kahn, was selected to work with Dr. Salk to design the institute. They designed a most efficient set of buildings, the contract was awarded, and on the day the construction began, the contractor was excavating, laying out the buildings. Dr. Salk came here to observe what was happening in the development of his uh, his dream that was coming true. And as he looked, he decided to go down on the lower part of the slope and just uh, look at the ocean, see what came into his mind. He realized that although a very efficient design had been created, there was not the spirituality, not the inspiration that he had experienced in Assisi. So on the plane on the next day, traveling to San Francisco with Lucan to finalize the construction financing, they agreed that they should cancel a contract and begin again to design something that had the spirituality, that had the inspiration, that had been responsible for his developing the polio cure. I first heard these experiences from Dr. Salk in early 1992. He was in Washington, D.C., representing the Salk Institute for Biological Studies, the recipient of the AIA's 25-year award for enduring excellence in design. There were many conversations with Dr. Salk beyond that point, all exploring his intuitive notion that architecture has a power to elevate and enrich the human experience. It is undoubtedly his intuitive notions and the interest that he created that have fostered further explorations now of a more scientific nature. He told us many times that all answers pre-exist. It's up to us to ask the right questions. But Dr. Salk also shared with us that it is up to all of us to strive to be good ancestors for future generations. What a great legacy he has left here in this great institution for future generations. The question is, how do you deal with this information to have it feed back on what you do as an architect in training and in practice? And as a neuroscientist, I believe that the brain is actually the, the causal organ for controlling... In trying to formulate what our legacy project might be, we heard from Norman Kuntz his story about Jonas Salk, and it really resonated with us. 
What was it about Jonas Salk's experience in the architectural setting that led him to his breakthrough? Out of a conversation with the local neuroscience research community grew the concept of the Academy of Neuroscience for Architecture. And one of the things that's really fascinated me about what we've come through so far in, in this journey is learning to communicate between the two disciplines. But I think we've come a long way, and, and the kind of discussion that we can have right now, I think, represents um, the fact that there really are bridges to be made. When we began to discuss how you would use neurosciences in architecture, what we know about neurosciences in architecture, I think we began to think, well, how would you know whether or not the information that you learned from neurosciences had any impact on what you were doing. And this fundamental sense of empiricism that we're stuck with as scientists is to get information, generate hypotheses, test those hypotheses, and then go back and evaluate whether or not that test worked. I'm really interested in something now much more fundamental, I think, which is can we use neuroscience understanding to do something which I don't think is published yet in the neuroscience literature, which is what does the brain do when it's responding to what architects believe are the attributes that they're adding to an architectural space? We need a methodology of how we're going to work at understanding what the brain is doing. There is p patterns of brain responses related to anxiety and patterns of brain responses related to pleasure. And the, so one could, you know, in, in a thought experiment, calibrate the brain's response to known conditions that do produce anxiety and pleasure, and then against that, those extremes, you know, ask the empirical question, how subtle can it be, and how sensitive would the brain be to these kinds of differences? Actually, one of the things that I guess we started out wondering about is what is there that uh, exists in the brains of all people that make them respond physiologically to any change of environment? One could look at whether the reception of particular types of, of architectural designs is, um, you know, what, what, is, what is the reception by the brain. One of the things that a lot of people do in cognitive science is try to understand how illusions are interpreted by the brain. I mean, architects must have some deep intuitions about these two uh, fundamental aspects of brain science, which is um, novelty and regularity. The brain really cares a lot about novelty. It's novelty that attracts our attention. A lot of it depends on what your hypothesis is initially, because if, yes, if you say, I want to design something that is for, for a retirement home so that it's a non-stressful environment, they don't have to move around very much, everything is easy to access, that sort of assumes that this is on a, you, you, you've reached the downward spiral, but you may hypothesize that what you really want to do is stimulate right, exactly. and force the individuals exactly. to actually to walk yeah. long distances to get to their food yeah. or long distances to see their friends. You design the environment very different. What we have to realize is we're not going to get immediate results. Neuroscience is in its infancy. Uh, the discourse between architects and neuroscience researchers is just opening. The potential is absolutely tremendous and in 10 or 20 years time we're going to be able to look back and realize how far we as architects have come in learning what it is in the human brain that is affected by the environment. We'll be able to realize that we have the ability to create spaces that allow people to reach their true potential. My hunch is that if the world moves in the direction in which we are trying to push it there will be new programs introduced into schools of architecture that enable embryo architects to have a knowledge base that they've never had before, that provides them with an understanding that people's perceptions and responses to the kinds of spaces that they design are not just aesthetics. People are there to learn because they're in an educational setting, or they're there to be healed because they're in a care setting are they there to worship because they're in a church setting. And it means that hopefully, 10 years from now, that the fundamental research, which some of you do, is influenced by adding additional light to our understanding of how, as Jonas Salk said, um, 
we are influenced by and become better ancestors for future generations.